Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. This is part two in a three part series on Burp Proxy. In this video, I'm going to go through some intermediate level uses of Burp. Many of the features I'm going to talk about today are only available in the professional edition of the tool, which you can acquire from PortSwigger directly. Also, if you reach a reputation of 500 on Hacker 1 and have a positive signal, you're eligible for a three month free license for Burp Pro, so go find some good bugs. I'm going to assume that you've already watched the first video and have Burp set up appropriately. For this run, I'm using all default settings. Let's jump right in. Let's first talk about Intruder. This tool allows for a large number of requests to be made based on a template and a pattern set that you define. Using this, you can find IDOR, Insecure Direct Object Reference, bugs, SQLi, and much, much more. Let's take a look at level 6 of Hacker 101, the Student Center. Here we're given three students in our system with suspiciously regular IDs. What can we do with this in Intruder? Well, they seem to be numeric, so we'll start there. I'm going to go to the edit page so it's in our proxy history, then send it to Intruder, just like you'd send something to Repeater. Switching over to the Intruder tab, you can see that the target tab for this instance is filled properly, so the Positions tab is what we really need to pay attention to first. We can see our HTTP request with some highlighted text surrounded by the section symbol. These indicate places where Intruder will attempt attacks. By default, all cookies and query slash post parameters will be selected automatically. Up at the top, we can see attack type. Dropping that down, we see four options, which are Sniper. This generates a single set of payloads, then tries them all on each position you mark. This is usually the best route if you're not looking to find bugs that require multiple parameters to simultaneously change. Battering Ram. Basically the same thing, but instead of trying them separately, it just puts each payload in every position all at once. Each position will always have the same value that the other positions have. Pitchfork. This takes a payload set for each parameter and iterates over all of them at once. You can think of this like a spreadsheet where each column is a position and each row contains a payload for each of these positions, and it just walks down those rows. And finally, cluster bomb. This generates a payload set for each parameter and independently iterates over all of those per position. As you can imagine, this can generate an absolute ton of requests. I only recommend this if you have a tiny number of payloads and or positions. The time taken is exponential with the number of positions. Getting back to our example, what we really want is the sniper because we only care about one position, that ID in the URL. So let's clear the positions and then add that ID. To do that, we just select the ID and hit Add. Over on the Payload tab, we can play around with a couple options. In this case, we're going to make it really simple. We're going to make a single payload with the type Numbers and tell it to make a sequential list around the ID we know. Let's say 58,000 to 60,000. That'll mean 2,001 total requests. We tell it to use a fixed number of integer digits and no fraction digits, just to make sure Burp does the right thing here. And for now, we'll skip the Options tab and just start the attack. And there we go. We can see the requests going out and the responses flooding in. There's a clear pattern. We're getting a 500 error for any ID that doesn't end in a 1. So let's close out this attack window and tweak our parameters just slightly. We'll tell it to go from 58,001 to 60,001 and step by 10. That means we should only hit good IDs until we run out of data. This has the nice side effect of cutting our request count from 2,001 to 201. And when we run that, we see exactly what we expect. Perfect. Going into each one to see what the name on the account is, though, is kind of cumbersome. So let's fix that. We'll go to the Options tab and check out the Grep Extract tool. This is an absolute favorite of mine. 
we'll enable this and then hit add. It shows us a standard response and it's as easy as double clicking the first name and you can see it automatically builds the matching logic. We'll repeat that for the last name. And now when we run it, we can clearly see the names. No need to go into the requests. Now let's take a look at something totally different that we can do with Intruder. In level 7, we have a login prompt with a seemingly known username, but no password. If we put in some arbitrary password, we get a password error. And if we type in an arbitrary username, we see that we get user does not exist. It does seem like admin is a real username, which is nice, but let's see if we can find any others easily. We send the login request to Intruder, clear everything but the username field, then select to use a payload type of runtime file. I give this a file that contains a list of common usernames, just something I pulled off the web, and that's all set. Let's run this attack and see what happens. Our requests are going through really quickly, which is great, but how are we going to find out if we have a valid user or not? Well, to the filter. We know that an invalid user will be a redirect to a page with user does not exist in it, so we can use a negative search in the filter to find just the valid users. And there we go, we found two users, but one of them, the one with the apostrophe, has a much longer response, and a 200 response at that. Clicking this, we can see a SQL error. We found a valid user, admin, as we suspected, and a bug all at once. Now that we have this SQL I bug, we have a bunch of options for what we can do. But in the interest of further using Intruder, let's find out what the actual password for this account is. Making the assumption that our password field is creatively called password, we can set up a simple SQL I payload that will use the invalid user error as an oracle for success. By doing this and using the like feature in SQL, we can use Intruder to brute force the password one character at a time. Each time we run this attack, we're getting one more character, and it's quickly becoming apparent that the password is also admin. We'll run it all the way to the end, and if we try any additional characters, we see the lengths are all the same. Checking that out on the site shows that the password really is just admin. Well, that's anticlimactic, but we did get our result. As you can see, Intruder is an extremely powerful tool and one that you'll likely use a lot. There are dozens of options I haven't even discussed here, and I recommend playing around with all of these to learn all about them. The Burp Scanner is a very advanced web app scanner that can find some fantastic bugs automatically. It allows two types of automated scanning, passive and active. Passive scanning happens as you just use the proxy normally. It scans for things like insecure cookie flags, password field options set improperly, etc. This is handy, but active scanning is where it gets fun. This actually does automatic tests for SQL I, XSS, and a huge number of other issues. For our purposes, we're going to focus on active scanning. There are two approaches to using active scanning in Burp. One is to select items specifically to test. The other is to enable automatic active scanning. The latter can be enabled here in the live scanning tab under scanner. Typically, you'll just add whatever domains or directories are in scope to your target, as discussed in the last video, then continue using the application. Active scans will automatically fire from there. This is almost always a bad idea. It generates a huge number of requests and can absolutely wreak havoc on applications. 
you might find bugs, but it might be the kind of bug that wakes up all IT staff at 4 a.m. because their database has disappeared. The safer and generally more effective approach is just to send things for active scanning from proxy history. Let's take that login post from level 7. We know there's SQL I here, but will Burp find that? Let's start an active scan and then go to the scan queue to watch this happen. Through the magic of editing, we'll speed this up as this will take a while. But if we look at the issues window now, you can see that we have a beautiful SQL I bug with a confidence level of certain. From these requests and responses, we can see that it intentionally caused an error, then subsequently confirmed that the parsing is that of SQL. In fact, it even determined that it's a MySQL database. Given that we knew about this bug, it's not a particularly impressive example, but Burp Scanner is an incredibly, incredibly capable tool. One valuable thing to note is that the Issue Activity tab gets all the results in one place, and this can be sorted to make your life easier. I typically sort by descending severity, which means I'll see the worst issues first. Then I can pretty easily work through those. If you're doing larger scans, I suggest going into Options and changing some of the Scan Issues fields. For instance, you may not care about ASP.NET or PHP issues if you know it's a Java application. These can drastically improve your scan times, as well as cutting down on false positives. And if you're unsure what an issue is, you can right-click on it and select Show Issue Definition to see a full description. Moving on from the scanner, let's talk about search. As you've seen, you can filter nearly everything in Burp, but sometimes you don't know what exactly you're looking for or where it'll be. Under the Burp menu, the first option is Search, which allows you to do simple searches over all of the data in your session. Let's take a quick example first. We know that we've seen several SQL errors. Let's find all of the requests that have those. Searching for syntax finds several requests across the different tools in Burp, each of which is a response to a different SQL injection test. Finding these results via normal filters or just scrolling through my history would be a big pain and nearly impossible on any large project but search makes it really easy. Now just for fun, we can also quickly find all the non-HTTPS URLs that are referenced. Or we can search for simple script tags. The uses for this really are endless. Now let's discuss a few of the more advanced proxy features. First is one of my favorite features of Burp Pro, the CSERF proof of concept generator. We can go into our proxy history, right click any item and go to engagement tools, generate CSERF POC. In this window, you'll see the request at the top and the generated code at the bottom. In this case, there's a CSERF token in place, but what if that's not there? We can remove it from the request and then click Regenerate, then copy and paste this into our browser for testing. And in this case, we see a forbidden message, so the CSERF token must be checked for. But if you're submitting a bug report for CSERF, you should absolutely include a proof of concept and this tool makes that utterly painless to do. Another useful tool is Find References. Again, we go to the Engagement Tools submenu and we select Find References. For this page, you can see a number of entries in the proxy and scrolling through the response, we can see a highlighted reference to the item we selected where it's linked from the main page of the level. Often when you have thousands of entries in your proxy history, it's easy to lose track of where exactly a given page was found. Find References lets you hunt that down with relative ease. The next two features I'm going to talk about are significantly less commonly used, but they're critical when they do pop up. Invisible Proxy is a feature that is most commonly used when you're testing a desktop or mobile app that doesn't respect proxy settings, or it behaves differently when connecting through a proxy. You can go to Proxy Options and add a proxy listener, specify what port and interface you want to listen on, 
Then in the request handling tab, there's a really cool feature. You type in the target host and port and then click support invisible proxying. In this way, any connection made to this listener, only this specific one, not any others you may have running, will automatically be forwarded to the host and port you specify, completely invisibly to the client. There aren't many cases where you'll make use of this, but there are times where absolutely nothing else will work, so it's good to know about. Now, under project options or user options, though this is something you almost always want to specify just on a per project basis, the SSL tab hides a bit of a critical feature, client SSL certificates. These are most commonly used in embedded devices and enterprise situations, but occasionally your client needs to be identified and simply doing it through the browser will break any proxy's SSL support. You simply click Add, specify the host or host that this should apply to, then select whether you're using a client cert file or a smart card. Usually this will just be a file, in which case you simply have to specify the path and the password used for that file. From there, this tends to just work and lets you communicate just fine. Well, that wraps it up for this session. I hope this gives you some new ideas for how to make use of Burp in your workflow, and I hope you go explore the multitude of options that I didn't even begin to touch on in this video, as there's a lot of great stuff. Go out there and find some good bugs, and stay tuned for the third and final part of this series. As always, thanks for watching, and happy breaking.